All right, good evening, everybody. This is Wednesday, June 14th, and I posted the links uh, to this chat session on Stunt Hanger. And I need to stop my YouTube feed momentarily. Okay, so uh, the link to get in here, if you're a member of Stunt Hanger, is on. Uh, stunthanger.com slash live streams slash at the bench and the top thread is wednesday hangout june 14th so look for that and i also posted the link in the chat box on youtube or if you go to uh, the stunt hanger youtube page the youtube uh, home page then this link is in the chat box to the right of the video and all right, now I'm set and ready to go. Until the viewers start coming in, I always try to have something to talk about so we don't just have dead air. And tonight, I guess, something uh, worth talking about. It was on my mind because I just bought some new pieces and parts and they came in the mail today. And, um, um, you know, different measuring tools. There's all kinds of things that you should have within reach at your uh, workbench. And, um, and we've got all sorts of things. Uh, you know, it, of course, starts with the ruler. And I like the ones that measure focus. Want to focus all the way to the end rather than having an eighth of an inch gap <clears throat> before the first mark. I've screwed up. I've, bunch of times because I forgot that I uh, had an extra eighth of an inch added to my measurements um, but the rulers with some numbers indented scribed into the ruler come in handy when you're using something like divider calipers everybody that's a big set everybody should have some divider calipers or otherwise known as a compass and they're good for transferring quick measurements if you're working on something and and uh, want to see what size something is on one plane and go over to another part you're building or another plane and uh, measure something then then uh, that's handy to walk across the shop and different types of calipers uh, ones for measuring the inside diameter of say a, a pipe or or distance between two things and an outside caliper which uh, seems to escape me right now it's in my lap outside caliper for measuring and I need some smaller ones of these too um, for measuring the outside width of a screw or a pipe or something like that actually for a screw you'd probably want a digital caliper or a vernier caliper plastic vernier caliper is good to be able to knock around and toss across the table and you won't hurt it and then <clears throat> when you get serious there's always digital caliper and i like this one i got it for about 30 34 bucks i think it lows and um, of course it's made out of chinesium by general tool and uh, it not only reads metric and uh, inch but it gives me fractions of inches too so that way I don't have to run back and forth to my little piece of paper I've got taped up on my um, magnifying lamp that converts everything between decimal and fraction um, and uh, also how about this this is a compass it's good for using for measure you can measure things like uh, elevator elevator throw and angle and uh, you can configure it in several different several different ways for measuring different types of angles and I could not do it without looking at the instructions the first few times I used it and I still forget how versatile it is sometimes so uh, nice to have nice to have for transferring angles from one piece to another um, what I was talking about the indented 
the indented uh, numbers that are scrubbed into the ruler. If you've got the divider type caliper here, then they stick into each measurement, sixteenth of an inch or a millimeter, and you can you can lock it in there and then get an accurate measurement between between two different measurements on the ruler. Yeah. Just things to make life easier. For the field, I got a couple of things I like to have. Um, so, uh, one must have item for me is plastic hemostats. They're great for clamping off fuel tubing, especially uh, on a hot day when I fill my tank up. I want to make sure the fuel's not expanding in the tank, so clip off my fuel supply with that until I get it out to the staging area um, for uh, putting rubber bands on fuel tanks in precarious positions, especially when part of it's hidden under the fuel tank. This is a spring hook that's left over from my copier technician days, and I kept this one. I've had this for decades, and it is a extremely valuable tool for uh, it's got a little pusher tool on one end. There we go. It's got a little uh, grabber and pusher tool on one end, and then a hook to pull a spring or a rubber band and a knurled middle so you can spin it. That's a great tool to have. And uh, so, uh, look what came in the mail today. And this is good. I've always wanted. I've always had taps and a tap handle because I've always worked on cars and lawnmowers and all kinds of things with nuts and bolts in them that need to be tapped and, and uh, threaded. But I've never never had a good set of dies in a die handle. And I bought a nice K&S die handle today. And I went ahead and got some new sets of dies. This is a uh, three millimeter by um, one half millimeter. I guess that's the pitch. Then I got a two, this is a 440. And I also got a 256, which is now on the floor between my feet. So you just have to take my word for it. And um, I've never, I've never used a die. I've always had the need for one, but never used it. And so I never paid close attention to them until I just took these out of the box today. And I noticed that this is split. This is split here at the top with a screw through it. So I'm assuming that this whole circle here is sprung with a certain amount of tension on it and with that screw maybe i can adjust the percentage of depth that this cuts into the rod and i'm hoping somebody will come on this chat tonight and educate me before i go out and start using these i actually put a 330 seconds rod in my vise today took the 440 die and put it in the wrench handle Made sure I had it centered. It's got it's, it's got little centering divots. It's got little centering divots bored into the edge of it, and oiled the rod. Put some oil on the teeth and the die, and started trying to cut some threads onto it, and had zero success at getting that die started cutting on the threads. And this is K and S brand. It's made in Japan, so. I'm guessing that's probably uh, possibly a higher quality than Chinese. I don't know. Maybe somebody can tell me that too. But uh, um, KNS Materials is easily available at the uh, eBay store, OmniModels.com, where I shop for a lot of my stuff. And um, so, yeah, that's what I got. And uh, looking at the box, it came in a pretty nice little box here. At, um, and it's got little detents that snap shut depending on how much stuff you've got in it with your handle. But uh, it says it's made in India. So I don't know. Maybe it's made out of Indium. <laughs> uh, but um, I, don't know where, I don't know where they get their 
hard metals in India. But uh, anyway, maybe maybe uh, Chris or one of our machinists can come educate me tonight before we get done. And uh, I can go out and start threading rods and stuff. Because, you know, when you're making controls, uh, linkages, that's a, uh, a good piece of rod you'd want to thread to be able to put a 440 ball link on the end of it. Um, something like that. In fact, I could probably, no doubt, get guys with um, left-hand threads so that I could put right-hand threads on one end, left-hand threads on the other, and then be able to just turn the rod to pull the two control surfaces to each other or farther apart from each other, um, rather than having to unbolt from the horn on one of them and make an adjustment. That would be really convenient. And I know uh, uh, RSM, Eric Rule, um, sells those among other people. I'm guessing that Tom Morris probably does too. Lower my camera a little bit here. But um, anyway, just, I don't know, I got thinking about it. Some, some things I like to have handy. The other night I was sitting in here talking about things I have by my computer. And, and that gave me the desk to bring some of my measuring tools in. You know, here's one of my by the computer things, a protractor, along with the drill gauge and other other things I use. Um, let's see, I got what else I got in a goodie box? Oh, I know. This is a leather awl. It's a sharp little punch, and uh, that's a great thing to have. You can jam that in all kinds of stuff. You can you can make pilot holes in balsa or center punch holes and uh, that's just a uh, that's just a regular uh, tap set I got there I've had that for a long time it's got all the common sizes 256 uh, through 540 and uh, 632 and then I've got uh, a couple of different measurements two and a half three three and a half millimeters and um, Oh, I know another thing uh, that these calipers are good for doing is for, uh, they're sharpened on the ends, so I use them when I'm cutting a prop down, I lay them in the grooves on the ruler to get exactly the different, the distance that I want to cut off the end of the prop, and then um, put one end in the center of the hub, and of course, if the center of the hub's too sloppy, you need uh, to stack some copper tube or not copper but some kind of metal tube in it this is a handy little thing to buy here and it really pisses me off now because i got this for 2.99 and when i first started buying this stuff k and s um k and s precision metals tube assortments um about two two or three years ago i found it on ebay first and i saw a package of it for two or three ninety nine and so I uh, send off my money and got back a big old sack full of as much different types of tubing and lengths and widths and even solid rods. Um I mean there must have been a, a half a pound of it and um and you know two or three ninety nine and so uh I have gotten depleted that and nowadays I'm um uh, ready to buy some more and this to the today's revelation wasn't new and I have uh, Known that this is what was going to come now. This is what you get it's instead of a whole sack full of stuff You get a, a wimpy little assortment like this that cost K&S way less than 2.99 to uh, The package to sweep this that's probably swept off the floor after after uh, making custom length other things that they make whatever that is um, but uh, in any case you can stack that tubing up and put it into the um, hub of the prop and uh, use it for putting securing one end of the caliper and scrub after you measure the caliper out to how much you want to cut off on your ruler you just scrub a line and snip it off um, and those tubing uh, kits are also convenient for fitting a prop. Um, for instance, if you want to take an AC, APC prop and, and, and bore out the back hole and make that the one which is supposed to be more accurate than the front hole, 
to fit um, the shaft of your prop, you might need to bush it with stacked tube and you can always get the right bits and pieces out of that pack of tubing to to stack up and make a bushing that'll fit in perfectly and uh, and um, fit on your prop shaft without any uh, weevil wobble at all. So I'm seeing we got about three viewers online. I hope somebody will come in and visit me. I think we're probably going to go in until about 1130 tonight. I say that every time and then we end up getting a bunch of viewers and having good conversations. And so I keep letting it run. But uh, uh, so we'll see how it goes. But I've enjoyed doing this. And I think I've done it solo without Sparky coming in the past couple of times. And I'm managed to uh, manage to hold it down without uh, without setting stunt hanger on fire <laughs> so uh, uh, y'all y'all come in and visit and for the uh, guys that prefer to just watch over on the YouTube side um, I will check on your chat box over there because as I've said we can't see it over here but I can go to open that tab in my browser and if you suggest something that you want to add to what we're saying or if you've got a question um, or any kind of advice or just a topic that you want to see us talk about post it in your chat box over there on the youtube side and every every 15 10 15 minutes i'll look over there and we'll we'll uh, talk about whatever you want to see and uh right now if you are logged into Google, if you've got Gmail, then you've got a Google account. All you got to be is signed into Google and have um, your computer recognizing your microphone and camera. Um, and you should be able to click that link that I put on the YouTube site and in Stunhanger and be able to come right into the chat with us. Um, I know some people still have trouble doing that and it's possible that you need to go in to Google up there where you sign in there's a uh, a square looks like a little square matrix of boxes it's, it's an icon click on that and a bunch of applications that Google offers will open up if you scroll to the bottom you'll see one for Google Hangouts if you open that you might find some settings for your microphone and uh, camera if you're having trouble with those that might be where the answer lies with it um, if you can sign in here with us um, at least to where you got a microphone working then we can uh, walk you through some of that too and and, and get you uh, with uh, your your camera and your microphone both working at the same time just remember uh, before you enter the chat the live streaming chat to uh, uh, either stop or close your YouTube tab so that we don't get that fed back through our speakers and then back through our microphones and it starts an endless chatter that that gets kind of disturbing and confusing sometimes so anyway Wednesday night having fun got four viewers now I'm hoping somebody will come along. The weather's looking pretty good for this weekend. I don't have any flying plans tomorrow. I did get to go fly last weekend. I told you all about it in our last session um, Monday night here. I talked about my flying expedition last weekend. Maybe get to go this weekend. I like this time of the year, too, with the days so long because um, the wind typically calms down as sunset approaches. But you can go out to the field at three o'clock when it's still hot as hell, get everything set up and then sit in the shade and mess around, um, do, you know, cut the grass or whatever you need to do. And then um, the wind starts dying down as as eight o'clock or nine o'clock approaches. And it makes for some pretty good flying weather, um, much more convenient than in the winter when um, you got to go out in the cold morning and 
get the flying done before it gets dark and starting at you know four thirty five o'clock depending on what time zone you're in or what part of your time zone you're in so I'm a summertime guy I can't stand cold weather but um, I do know that some people are heat sensitive so and and y'all might have heard me mention it on here before something to have in your flight box when you go out to the field it's a good idea to take a uh, bottle of the green drugstore alcohol with the uh, mint in it. It's either menthol or wintergreen. Usually you can buy it on the same shelf. And I saw it at Walmart. They have it at most grocery stores too. Uh, uh, right there with the regular bathroom alcohol and 70% isopropyl and it's minty. So um, when you, if you start feeling like you're overheated, poor a few glugs of that into some cooler ice water that's melting but still cold and got ice floating in it soak a rag with that ring that over the back of your neck and your head and it'll make you scream out loud but it will chill you down to the core and fend off heat stroke so for some of you guys that have trouble in the heat of the summer keep that in mind that's a great way to cool down suddenly or if you see a buddy who looks like they might be getting overheated um you know give them a give them a good douse it's kind of like the the gatorade douse over the coach's head at the ball game but uh this is uh, uh good for warm, warning off warding off heat stroke and in the carolina heat down here some days we fly in and uh 60 or 80 percent humidity in a 105 or 110 degrees and it'll get hotter than that sometimes but not typically but and uh, i know some uh, we were talking to somebody the other night i think it was minnesota mike he lives out in uh, the western desert areas and it gets a hell of a lot hotter there than it does here and um, i thought was telling him this same story uh, and uh, I think I told Charles Carter about it in San Diego. That's another hot area, not San Diego proper, but he lives near in that area. But um, if some of y'all would join up and talk with me, then we'll keep on going. If it continues to be empty, I'll probably, I'll probably shut it down. But uh, I'll hang out a little while and wait. I don't know how long I can think of brilliant entertaining things to talk about all of my uh, uh, tools oh I know I got another tool I didn't tell you about let's see these are great um, these little mushy sanding blocks you get them they're squishy like a sponge except well firmer than a sponge but get them at get them at uh, Lowe's in the painting section and um, you know I use them the first time uh, until they get too worn out and they get holes picked in them and whatever else but then I just wrap them I just I just uh, cut a piece of sandpaper out and this is just open coat 320 I've got wrapped on it now I've got several of them and and I just you can see where I've got it pinned on one side right there so um, they're good for getting in around around fillets if you do big fillets like I do and getting in corners and and uh, flat surfaces if you're sanding a fuselage uh, you know just lightly sanding all over between paint jobs these are good for that and then uh, you can rip the sandpaper off and pin a new piece on when you get through and if you really want to piss yourself off um, just don't pay attention sometime and be looking away and reach down and put those pins against what you're sanding on and then realize what you've done so do be careful about that that will uh, uh, ruin a job but other than that uh, i love these little pads i got three or four of them i've got some square ones that i keep my thousand grit and, and six and eight hundred grit on for wet sanding and um they'll they'll hold water too and keep the sandpaper wet too uh, but uh, anyway another good suggestion for the uh, uh, well-equipped shop man and um, you know I'm sitting here talking about my taps and dies and stuff and 
so if you're a machinist or an expert mechanic, don't get, please don't get irritated with me for trying to tell you how to use your tools because I am a layman when it comes to most of that. I just figure it out as I go along and I've never had any formal training, but I would love to know. And so um, rather than, rather than getting irritated that I'm trying to tell you what to do, let me know, put it in the YouTube chat box or somehow contact me and, and tell me how I can better use my tools because I've had tools for years and, and used them the way I knew how and found out there was a better way that I could have been doing things and um, makes life easier when you've got the right tools and when you know how to use the right tools. So let's see. Sitting here hoping some of y'all will come in. I'm going to pop over to YouTube right now and see what I see. Which one? Yeah, this is it. Okay, well, we got some people on. Sweaty Salami. Hey, big fan, what's up? What's up? <laughs> oh, I started. Oh, I started. Which? How are you doing, Rusty? Hey. Hey. Hang on, let's see. Oh, hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, Chris, how you doing? Pretty good. I thought that was me echoing. I think, uh, I think we got your echo going again tonight. Really? Hey, I'm hearing yeah, myself I'm talking in the background. Let me let me close all my other tabs. Make sure it's not me. It could very well be. That one's not on. That one is closed. Yeah, it's all closed on this end. You hear? You still hear an echo? I don't hear it when you talk. I do hear it when I talk. That's weird. It is. It is. But, but maybe it's somehow maybe it's somehow looping through looping through your microphone and coming back to me. And coming back to me. I don't know how to. I don't know. I don't have any other tabs open. I mean, when you put your earphones on the other night. On the way. Oh yeah. That was a kind of a pain, pain in the ass. So I got some questions for you when we got when we get this uh when we get this, uh, out. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but, Okay. Well, I don't hear myself echoing anymore. All right, how's that sound? That sounds pretty good. Yeah, that solved the echo problem. Just, yeah, I can barely hear an echo, but it's not anything that's intrusive. So, um, okay. I don't know what's going on with that, but did you get in early enough to hear me talking about my uh, new tap set that I bought? No, I saw the standing uh, block. Okay, well... I brought some measuring tools in and just a few things that I think are convenient to have at the well-equipped workbench. And I figured I would talk about my tools while I was waiting for somebody to show up. And today in the mail, some taps and a tap handle arrived that I ordered because for years and years, I've always had, well, it was, it was die. It was a die handle and some dies that arrived. I've always had some taps and a tap handle, but I've never had dies. And I want to be able to thread rods and, and chase the threads and bolts and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. But 
upon looking at the dies, I see that there's more to them than I expected. And I figured I'd have to go on YouTube maybe and look up some how to's, but since you're here, um, I've noticed that this is a three millimeter die. And of course it's split right here and it's got a screw in the side of it right. is that for adjusting the percentage of depth it cuts or what it was the purpose of having that is this thing sprung tight with that well, screw it's, it is a, it's an adjustment <clears throat> to tighten up or loosen the uh the thread cut yeah you know for example when you're doing like uh precision threading uh there's different classifications that um, like in the machining industry, if I had to do something, I'd have a go and a no-go gauge. Mm -hmm. And when you're cutting different materials, like say you have coal roll or you yeah. have stainless steel, totally two different types of material. The coal roll cuts very easy, so there's not a lot of pressure and it'll go right through it and it'll cut nice. But when you got stainless, yeah, there's okay. a tendency to uh, spread the dye a little bit and yeah. it it's very tough. And then when you take it out, it's actually a little bit tighter than it's supposed to be. So what you could do is, is tighten that, you know, it'll collapse. You don't uh, loosen up the screw and it'll collapse. Yeah. Or you can spread it apart to make it bigger, whatnot. Yeah. For general purpose, you shouldn't have to touch that. You really? You should be already set. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. I the, mean, first thing, the first thing uh, I did was took a 332nd rod and camphored the end of it, clamped it in my vise vertically, and then came down on it with a 440 tap and tried to turn it to start threading, but I never could get it to bite. And I was wondering if it was screwed in too small, but I didn't want to touch anything until I learned more about it. Uh, it's definitely going to take a little practice. <clears throat> yeah. Do you have a drill press? I do. The best thing that I mean, I don't know how how long is the rod that you're going to be tapping. Just about an inch, something like that. that. Yeah. Oh, that, that's easy. All you got to do is just take that rod and put it in the drill chuck, and take the tap and put it on your handle, and then stick that handle on your like you're going to drill it. Yeah. And just yeah. just bring it down, and you can turn it by hand to keep it nice and straight, and just yeah. Keep, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, just just run it in easy. A little yep. bit of oil, put some yes. oil on it, and just run it in easy. If you get really good, you can turn that sucker on and go. <laughs> I saw a machinist do that, and but a, this guy knew what he was doing. I wouldn't dare. Right. Um, I used to do that years ago, and but uh, I wouldn't. I would not suggest doing that on your drill yeah. press. But the drill press is a good way to get it started because you want it to go in straight. If you get them yes. cocked, they get all. Nasty. Yeah. Yeah, because that was, I didn't notice that it was easy to be wobbling, and that's never a good way to work yeah, a tap or a dime. Yeah, about to start. Once you get it started, you know, you're good. Yep. Yeah. I mean, okay. Nice, uh, what about, uh, I've got some uh, tin weight air tool oil. Is that okay for cutting oil, or should I get something special? Yeah, uh, for what you're doing, any oil will work. Okay. Anything should work. Yeah. It's a matter, you know. It's a, that those rods are pretty soft. Yeah, that's why I figured they were too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll try it again with more confidence. Making linkage or something? That's exactly right. I want to be able to screw a ball link on the end of it. Okay. So yeah. it was a 440 tap, 440 ball link, and I figured 332nd rod uh, uh, was the right width to put a 440 tap and uh, uh, thread into, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be right? Um, if you look up online. Yeah, in fact, can, I've got a chart, I think. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. I mean, <clears throat> major diameter, you find that the major diameter on the 440, and that's what your rod thickness should be. Yeah. I mean, three, you three. go to the store, you go to the store, you got, the, you know, the hobby shop, they sell those linkages, you just measure one of them. I think they're yeah. like ninety thousandths or ninety three thousandths for a four forty. That looks yeah, yeah. that's a three thirty seconds. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
that sounds about right. I was not sure if it was seven sixty fourths or three thirty seconds, but yeah, oh nine thirty seven. So oh ninety three, oh ninety four, something like that. All right. Excellent. Cheesecake. Yeah, so, so I, what uh, you been doing? For, what you been doing for fun today? Uh, not much. <laughs> Working. Worked all day. Came home. Took the tractor out. Moved some dirt for my landscaping while the light was still out. Came in or cooked some dinner. Cooked some steaks up. That's what I had. I had a ribeye steak. Oh yeah, I had some. I had some uh, Kroger special uh, New York strips. Weren't too uh, bad. Four, we had bought four steaks for like twelve bucks. So that's that pretty good. good. Yeah. Yeah, family pack of steaks. Yep. And then uh, worked on my nobler a little bit. Uh, just farting around little stuff. I uh, crimped up. Finally cut the lines on the you know for the controls. I had it looped. I got this arf, and the lines were absolutely terrible. It, it looks like. You know, they, they pre, they, you know, everything's pre-made and the, yeah. the lines, they go up to the bell crank and through the wing, they're absolutely terrible. It looks like, like the person that crimped them was on their first day of the job. I mean, they crushed everything, the eyelet, everything. I'm like, you know what? I ain't flying that. So I just put in some new, all new, all new stuff, rerouted it, all that crap. And then, and I, I fed it through there. You know, I taped the ends. I took the old stuff, cut the ends off. I glued them with the CA, and then I wrapped them with some tape, and I slid them all the way through. And then I had this loop on the end. So I never cut it through the whole build because I didn't want them to fall into the wing. So I just mm -hmm. left it, you know, a loop. Plus, you can hang it up. It's pretty cool. So anyways, <laughs> I finally cut them, and I uh, got those lined up nice and did the crush on the... Things I was going to ask everybody, you know, what do you guys prefer? Do you like to crush them with the tubes or do you wrap them? Either way. Um, I, I've, I've, in fact, I do it both ways, but uh, I prefer to wrap them. But sometimes when you're wrapping those 027s, that stiff wire is uh, yeah. tough on my fingers. And, and my buddy's got a swedging tool and I trust it. So um, a lot of times I'll swedge the lead outs. Uh, okay. Or, uh, but for flying lines, I always wrap those. Really? Actually, I uh, um, buy them pre-cut from Morris and then wrap the thimbles on with uh, about uh, 28 gauge copper wire, something like that. But swedging works. I don't like just taking a uh, tube and and crunching it with a pair of needle nose pliers. It's better than nothing. But uh, uh, that's kind of a uh, iffy way to do it yeah i did the, i made my own lines up i just finished those the other day so i came up with like 60 foot six inches or something like that not about just about 60 foot and i left them at 60 foot and then the from the wing or from the center of the plane to the eyelets that's uh, another 41 inches so it's going to be like 43 feet or so for, mm -hmm. the, for my trial you know first flight and if I have to shorten them up I can always shorten them I didn't want to make it too short right yeah I always and start longer to buy a whole new set of lines and stuff but yeah um but I what I doing I was just I crimp them with the vice or the with the players after I get it all set up and tight then I take them and I put them in the vice and I flatten them suckers out so it molds right around the wire um and, uh, yeah I have got a set from some a highly reputed guy, Alan Brickhouse. When he passed away, I inherited some of his line sets, and that's the way they were put together. Um, yeah. And um, so, you know, I and I hadn't ever had any problem with them. So, yeah, yeah you just I don't, I don't like that crimping. That that crimping. I did that on my first plane, and I did not like it at all. Yeah, it looks like crap, and it just it doesn't seem like it's secure to me. Yeah. Hey, Charles, how you doing, buddy? I don't know if you can hear. Can you hear me, Charles? Oh, now I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. 
How are you tonight? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm uh, just going to hang out for a little bit. I actually got a lot of stuff to do again tonight, but I thought I'd just check in. Okay. Well, I'm glad to have you. I'm not planning on staying on too late tonight myself, but uh, here we are. So um, I uh, opened up with the uh, first 15 minutes of time when nobody's here talking about some tools and showing some things I keep on my workbench. And then Chris dropped in, just the man I needed to talk to because I got a new set of uh, uh, dies and a die handle today and uh, needed some advice from a machinist on how to use them. So that worked out. Very good. Good. So do you know Chris? Yeah, no, we I've seen him before, ago. though. Yeah, we talked about a week ago. You were on last week or a week before, I don't remember. Yes. Yeah. Let me get more comfortable here. Yeah, I have a machinist friend who helps me out, too, so it's always nice to have a machinist somewhere available because we need them in yeah. this hobby. Yeah. Yeah, I wish I knew more about it, but uh, that was, uh, unfortunately, one of the things that I know now I need a, I need to have learned in my earlier years, but never did get around to it. So I'm learning what I can as I go along. That's usually yeah. the way I make my way. Never, never too late to learn. No. no. Yeah, That's it's exciting. Learn something new every day. It's always nice to learn something. It's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And it can really help with your precision. Machinists are always very precise. So just having a, a relationship with machinists would really... I know for me, it has helped me out immensely, um, just being very precise. Yeah. And I've also, something I've learned uh, recently is I'm looking more into uh, the machinery side of things is that uh, there are some benefits to the inch system over the metric system. I've always cursed the inch system, wishing we'd gone. 100% metric back in the 70s um, and uh, but now that I'm working with uh, you know uh, fractions of the things that we work with that it is uh, uh, more convenient to use the inch system sometimes once you get the hang of it I mean uh, you know what's that what's what's half of uh, uh, um, well, I don't know. I better not start trying to sound smart. I'll look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> it just gets, uh, it's getting more intuitive the more I use it. Let's just put it that way. I understand. Yeah, I have to float back and forth many times between the two. Oh, yeah. um, but I wish it was just one system. It would be easier. Well, on a daily basis, I deal with both systems and parts. I'll get a print. It'll be an all an inch, and then I'll get a print that's in metric, and then I'll get a print that's in metric with American tap taps in it, and then I'll get a American print that has metric taps in it. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it could drive you nuts. It's just, so, and then you get a German print. Holy crap! You get a German print, everything's backwards. They do. Oh, really? Everything. Yeah, absolutely. They. I don't know if you ever look at a blueprint, but when you look at a blueprint, American blueprint it's always a certain way well when you look at a european blueprint they're backwards you flip them the other way and it can be very wow. deceiving very deceiving and it'll be in metric then they got the little funny symbols <laughs> yeah those europeans <laughs> those the europeans are they've got it's like a whole different world over there whole different world but you know it works that's Usually, you unless uh, two different countries are trying to uh, put a lander on Mars and, and uh, confuse the orbital uh, calculations with uh, metric, get metric and inch system uh, confused with each other. We lost one that way. Wow. <laughs> Back in the 90s. Yeah, I think so. I think I remember something like Might that. Might have been more recently than that. It was a I think it was a polar lander, but um, we lost it on entry into the uh, atmosphere, and they hit the atmosphere had to do with the metric at the system, wrong angle. Something like that. Yep. Something got confused. I so I think they that. came up with some uh, new protocols to intercept 
mistakes like that. Live and learn. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yep. So, Chris, what are you working on? Oh, well, I was just telling Rusty, I uh, I was still messing around with that nobler arf. Just uh, I just do maybe one or two things a night, and uh, I just uh, I told him I had replaced the uh, lead out lines in it because they were so crappy that right. I didn't trust them, so I just redid them and. I finally just cut the end lines because I looped it through and I had a little loop on the end. So I uh, finally cut them and I crushed them and, you know, use a tube, you know, crush them with a the little tube and stuff. I was asking him what he, what he preferred, whether, he, you know, wrapping or the crushed tube. And that's about it. That's all he did. Yeah, I, I personally wrap everything. That's the yeah. ultimate way, I think. Swedging is next. And I think one's just about as good as the other. Um, yeah. Swedging is FAA approved for full size airplanes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have a, a Nobler ARF that I did a lot of work on, Chris. I actually put a four inch bell crank in there. Yeah. And replaced the uh, lead outs, obviously. And I, um, well, I did so much, I can't remember it all. But oh, I cut off the wingtips and put blocks and hollowed them out. Yeah. Put adjustable yeah. lead outs, adjustable weight box. Um, I gusseted the uh, engine bearers, um, replaced the yeah, flaps. Yeah, about that. Um, Did you post some of that in a build thread on Stunt Hanger Charles? On Stuka Stunt, actually. Oh, uh, okay. And then um, there was a little short article in Stunt Hang on uh, Stunt News. Uh, had some pictures of my plane. And then, and um, then I described all the mods I did that I can remember. I built that plane um, over the course of uh, uh, ten years. <laughs> Not every day, obviously, but uh, Is that just a, I would. A scratch built? No, it was a Nova Arf that I pretty much just stripped down, recovered right. it, and yeah. modified it. And um, I would, I would come into another airplane and I could finish sooner so now to get on that that'd be flying that particular one and then um i just kept coming into other planes and uh it's kept me from getting back to the nobler and i finally finished it uh, a couple years ago yep. and uh matter of fact i hope to be flying it tomorrow it's a really good flying plane chris did your nobler have a metal bell crank in it that was coated with some kind of sparkly plating yeah mine had that originally too Kind of looks like a like a like metal flake, Silverstone or something. Yeah, yeah. It looked like a like, yeah, like a yeah. I remember that. I thought that was kind of unique. Was yours like that, Chris? Mm, it looked like a stamped piece of steel, and that's about it to me. Okay, mine. Uh, special. I, I'm I'm rebuilding a nobler now because I had an old one that I had never seen the inside of before, and I wrecked it. Um, a year or two ago and I've got another fuselage. I had some spare parts and this fuselage had the same kind of bell crank in it. But when I took the old one apart, all of that plating had, had sloughed off and there was bits and pieces of little silvery stuff that had turned black from use and friction, I guess. And it was just really? all over the inside of the center section. And wow. I, oh, this is, this sucks. So I put a, <laughs> I put a uh, plastic SIG bell crank in it for putting it back together now. Yeah. Well, you know, that might have been, you know, the efficiency on making one of those, you know, obviously they're stamped, and they probably came across a lot of you know, uh, material that they could use for that that had some kind of a coating on it. Yeah. They just run, ran them through the presses and punched out what they could punch out. It looked like it had been... Yeah, it looked like it had been stamped from a piece of cookware or something, yeah. you know, with a non-stick surface on it. Yeah, it, it probably was. It's probably some kind of good deal they had on some material, and they just made parts with it and sent it out its way. Because I know they don't put material on there as part of the process because that would right. cost money. That's right. Yeah. So they found some old dish yeah, pans and stamped them. <laughs> I can barely hear you, Chris. 
Oh yeah. I can hear you, but I have to really pay attention. Well, I have to wear my earphones because or, if I take them off, Rusty gets an echo. I understand. So I, I'm talking about your mic volume. Is there any way you can bump it up, uh, uh, Rusty? Can you bump up his volume? I, I believe I can. Yeah, he can bump it up from his too. Let me look at my control panel here. So you got Chris. Uh, see what it sounds like now. How's it, how's it sound now? Oh, better. Better. Oh, better. Does yeah. it? Does yeah. it? Okay. Because yeah, I don't, I don't know how I can adjust to here. Yeah. Yeah. Are you hearing any echoing, Charles? Uh, a little echo, but, it, echo, but it's, it's tolerable. 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 Okay. Okay. I'll leave it like that for a while then. Yeah, I hear myself. I don't hear anybody else's echo. I just hear everything I say a half a second behind myself. Yeah, I don't think I have an echo. I have an echo. Oh, I do have an echo. I did hear it. I did hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a that's a glitch we're just gonna have to learn to live with. <laughs> yeah. Life in a perfect world, right? Yeah. 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 So hopefully I can get this thing going pretty soon. I mean, I'm just uh, I'm anxious to fly it, but. At the same time, I don't want to smash it. I mean, the last time I flown a control line airplane was probably when I was 15, 15 years old. Oh, okay. And I'm, okay. And I'm 51 now, so. <laughs> well, when you were 15 built, years old, you were able to do what? Do what? Well, uh, flew a ringmaster. And but did you fly upside down or? Down or? Uh, no, I didn't get that far. The only upside down was in the ground. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, uh, like I said, I haven't done stunt. I want to learn how to do stunt. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's kind of why I bought this thing. I didn't want to put a, I mean, I build planes. I built a lot of planes. Rubber band, you know, performance gliders, uh, radio control. You know, I've built a lot of stuff. I'm more of a builder than I am a flyer. So... <clears throat> I didn't want to go out and, you know, I bought some plans for a Nobler. I bought some plans for a BBQ, Al Rabi, Hellcat, and, you know, I'm just looking at it. And I like to build, but I don't want to build something and then smash it. Yeah. So that's why I went with the ARF. You know, if, if I bust it up, I can go buy another one. I got all the stuff for it. And, you know, it's simple, you know. Yeah. If you, uh, if you want to really spend, spend some time seriously uh, learning stunt, you should really consider building some good profile models because you can fix a profile model overnight or in three or four days where if you crash that troubler, it might take you a week or a month to fix it. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Well, I got that other plane I showed you, that little Ringmaster Junior. Yeah, so. yeah. That one's a profile, and that's, that's probably going to go up first. <laughs> yeah, good idea. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, I'll yeah. shoot down. I got another, I got a Midwest Mustang that's about 80% done that I got a 15 for it. And uh, I put some flaps on that one. Didn't, uh, plans didn't call out for it, but I just put it in there. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of messing around. I, came across that Nobler, I said, well, you know what? I'll probably finish an ARF Nobler before I finish that Mustang because I, uh, I get too anal about stuff. I want it to look perfect, you know, but... Yeah, that's part of that machinist yeah, background. background. Yeah. 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 Anal. Being anal. <laughs> that's called meticulous. That's called meticulous. There, we go. Yeah. there we go. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. That's why that I am meticulous to an anal degree. <laughs> Yeah. A nobler R, uh, the way it flies, it really is uh, dependent upon when you put the motor in, the engine, yeah. where you put it at. Because I've flown several R's, and I noticed that sometimes one is kind of won't turn very much, and then the other one's more sensitive. And it's just the placement or the weight of the engine. Really? You know, so, uh, but for the most part, I think you'd be happy with the nobler. It flies really good. Really good. Have you bored the like holes for the engine to mount yet? The mount yet? 
Oh yeah, everything's mounted in there. The cowl's cut. Um, uh, it's a, uh, it's an Evolution thirty six. Oh, those are cool engines. Those are cool engines. Yeah, it's a no, it's a cool looking engine. It's got that little purple. It's got the. Yeah, I like the, I like the slanted fins on the head. That's, yeah, pretty, cool. that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's yeah. a good yeah. engine. Engine. Uh, it's very powerful. Run, powerful. Uh, yeah. You might need to get somebody to make you a smaller Venturi for stunt. I got well. I got three Venturis for it. Because, I've heard they're all too big, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah. I I ran it with all of them in it, and I got I got it to run at you know what's it 9500 RPM, almost an like ounce a minute, you know, of fuel. Uh, that was on a bench. I ran about a gallon of I ran about a gallon of fuel through that thing. Wow, very good. Very good. Yeah, it, it runs. I mean, it runs. It starts easy. I mean, I I shouldn't have too many problems with it. Anyway, and I had a uh, what do I have on there? Ten four or eleven four? For a thirty. What size did you what say it was? Thirty six. Thirty six. Thirty I think it was a ten four. Probably some. Probably some. Somewhere between 10 and 11, 36. So either one might work. Might work. Yeah, it's either it's either a 10 four or a, or 11 four. I can't remember. But anyways, uh, it looks like a big prop for the motor. You know, it it ran great. I mean, on the bench it did anyway. So I didn't uh, want to get it going so I could start picking the model up because I put in the uh, Uniflow. I put in a Uniflow system right, on it. Right. Right. And um, I want to see how that works out. But they say when you use a Uniflow system, it tends to uh, affect the, uh, what is that, the 242 cycle or the 42? Yeah. You know, when it yeah. pops in and out of, into a two cycle and it goes up, you know, inverted or whatever. You know, when you're doing maneuvers, it doesn't go in and out of two cycle real, real easy with that Uniflow system. Yeah, you know, my, my, my experience has been with Uniflow that it just gives you a, just gives you a, a pretty steady, steady engine, engine run, run from, start, from start, to finish. start to finish. Right. You know, yeah, a, lot a lot of other systems, systems toward the end, toward of, the the end, end of the run, run you get a, a lean, lean run. run. And with yeah. the with the, with the Uniflow, Uniflow system, system, you get a steady, steady run, run from start, start to finish. finish. Um, that's, that's one that's not so much the case. Much the case. They run the same, that's same that's way when you started. Except for when it runs out of gas, of course, you'll have a little lean, little burst, and then they'll run out of gas. Yeah. But it's a real good system. 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 Yeah. But it's a real good system. Well, hopefully I did it right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got up, two, I got two mufflers that came with it. I got the the big honking closed muffler. You know, that big piece of whatever you want to call it. Yeah, trash can hanging up muffler, the side of it. yeah and then uh it comes with a short stack on it. You know, tongue yeah. muffler's called. Oh yeah, a little tongue muffler. So I'm kind of curious on how that's going to react with the two, but I know that I got it balanced pretty good with just the tongue muffler. Uh, when you first fly, you might want to just try the tube muffler, the tube muffler just to give you an extra, give you an extra nose weight just to be on the safe, safe side. side. And then after, yeah. after you get accustomed to it, then with the tongue muffler, if you want to lighten the nose a little bit. Yeah, I just realized that. Posted, I put the link over on YouTube and forgot to hit the send button, and everybody's over there hollering for the link. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it's up there now. Dang, that was stupid. I always find some way to block everybody out. You have to get yourself a checklist. No kidding. No kidding. That's a good idea. Checklist. Yeah, your hangout checklist. Hey, Wiley. Wiley. Well thanks. well, thanks. I finally I'm got sorry. in, and I don't know how I would. You know, I don't know. I got to figure that out how to get in. And, and you know, now I have my camera where it's working here on my computer, and for some reason I'm not getting it to work. Here it is. There it went. Oh, okay. Okay. Right on. Right on. Now we can see. Yeah, we're you're not as ugly as we thought you were. Oh. Wow. <laughs> That makes my day. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, 
I am so sorry to all you YouTube guys that I forgot to push the send button because I made sure I posted the link before I even started the broadcast, but I forgot to click the go button. Well, that's all right. I've been listening to you. I've been here since pretty close to the beginning when you started on your machine stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. But I've been trying, I've been in stunt hanger back and forth like, like I don't know, six, eight times, and for some reason, I can't get linked up in there, and I don't know what that's about. You can find the link, but clicking it doesn't work. Is that it? Yeah, and, and I'm not sure why that why that would be. I don't know. I, it's it's the exact same link. But. Are, are you logged into Stunt Hanger? No, have you got to be logged in? I don't think so. You can be if you can open the at the bench thread and see my post from tonight. It says uh, Wednesday, June fourteenth. Yeah, I clicked. Yeah, I clicked on that and it, it wasn't letting me come in. So and and something's wrong with my login. It won't let me log in. I've tried some different uh, usernames and, and passwords and and for some reason. I can't get none of it to work for me. That happens once in a while. Usually uh, an email to Sparky will take care of it. Um, I don't know if you can look up his profile and get his address or not, but if you can't, let me know and I'll, and I'll uh, get it for you. Okay. Okay. In fact, I'll, I'll uh, look it up while we're on here tonight. Hey guys, I actually just wanted to pop in. I got some stuff I got to work on. Night. Night. So I'm glad you have some people showing up. Okay. Good night. Good night. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming to visit us. My pleasure. I'll talk to you guys some other time. All right. Have a good one. So, what you up to today, Wally? Oh, I haven't done a whole lot of anything today. My back's been killing me so bad today. I just I took it easy. I'm supposed to go help my son rewire his boat trailer. Uh, he's had it sandblasted and power coated, and and uh, we're under all brand new wires and lights and stuff on it. And, uh, Getting ready for a good boating season, I hope. Yeah. So anyway, I told him. We'll just wait until tomorrow to start on that. So. Uh oh. We've got a malfunction on that. Looks like Wally locked up. No, he's still moving. You know what's happening? I don't know if that has anything oh, to do with it. But my phone, I just got a message on my phone and I checked it. And. Uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with my Wi-Fi for my computer or not. Yeah, it's possible. I don't know. It could have made, it could have put a momentary pause in it, but everything seems normal now. I'm gonna look back over on YouTube to make sure I hadn't screwed anybody else up. Sweaty salami. I wonder who that is. I don't know who that would be. <laughs> Well, hey, sweaty. You're welcome to come in and talk if you want to. Somebody named Gumby. We uh, get a few more people on here for the weekend and all. String out some of these extension cords and show you some of my stuff. But I feel pretty good just being able to get a camera to work tonight. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you got to go too. Yeah, this would have been a pretty nice night to go flying over here. And, uh, I didn't have nothing ready to go. And my back, my back, feeling the way it was, I thought I'd better just take it easy today, man. It's been a, it's been a brewer today. Where are you at, Wally? I'm in Pocatello, Idaho. 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 Wow. Yeah, I, I live in a town of about 60 people, 60,000 people. Oh, wow. And then out north of us, uh, an outskirt of this town, there's probably another 25 out there. Uh, oh, yeah. and, uh, 
me and my two sons are the only ones that I know of the flight control line here in this town. Wow, I know. I know nobody really flies around my area. I'm in the Michigan. You're in Michigan? Very few, You're Michigan? Yeah. Very, very few control line clubs, and if they are, they're a couple hours away. And so uh, my town I live in is only like 2,500 people. I'm in the farmland. So do you uh, have to drive far to get to a place to fly? Uh, I haven't actually found a place to fly other than my old house I used to live in that I still own. In uh, Dearborn, there's a, in the park, they have a, a ring there. I think they call it a speed ring, but Sparky thinks they used to ride a, run the cars on it, but I don't know. It's got a, it looks just like a control line ring, but it's all concrete. I it's, think got, it's, it's got a fence around it. Around it. No. no. I remember fence. you guys talking about that the other night. I, I was uh, listening to you because I wasn't set up to come in here and all that. But uh, yeah. the, the, are they still running the cars in there? No, I don't think so. It's probably from years ago. I mean, it's probably in the 50s and 60s when it, all this used to be big. You know, from before radio control became big, the uh, control line was the biggest thing around. And they ran the cars because they got... Uh, they have the gra they have a grass field there with a concrete center, you know, pad. Yeah. And then yeah. The, the other one is a concrete circle with a concrete center pad. So I'm thinking they probably had, you know, like a you know, like a speed racing or something like that. I don't know. I've I seen a line it. circles built like that too, yeah, with just a great a, 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 um, a center concrete circle, and then a strip, strip, sixty feet out or however far out, and then it's grass in between. I got to go check it out, and I'm gonna measure that because if nobody's using it, I'm gonna use it. <laughs> well, I'd say yeah. that'd be a good be a good place to go if you can get on there. On there. You don't have to worry about people worry about screaming, at screaming at you. Yeah, that is true. And that's, the only problem is the neighborhood around it is not that great. Probably have to go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there alone. Yeah, that's yeah, what's that's nice what's about nice. flying with two or three people. They can, they can, you can post them around the circle to kind of keep an eye on that kind of thing. And we was talking the other night about flying alone, and I haven't done that yet. Not yet. And I've been kind of toying with the idea of doing that, but it's not a safe situation. Because most of the flying I do is in a football field, you know, on a on school property. So there's kids that are coming and going all the time, and that's what freaks me out. Yeah, you got a pretty rough neighborhood there. No, I live in a great neighborhood. It's just uh, there's so many kids that... You know, and they got a, you know, they got basketball hoops. And not long across the street, they got tennis. And, you know, there, so there's a lot of people that are coming and going, and there's a lot of people that even walk the, the, the they have a track around the football field, and a lot of people walk that for exercise. And, uh, most of the time, most people help you out, but it's the kids that worry about. Worry about. Yeah, they walk right into it. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, can't, they can't always see your lines and you don't realize you're connected to lines between you and the plane. Yeah, and it's the, the littler, the more trouble it can be, you know, like the three or five year old, you know, that, oh, that's cool, so look at this, you know, and then they, 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 they sometimes they'll cruise across the circle and don't even realize what they're doing. They just don't even, you know, they just don't realize it. One of y'all the other night was saying you were out flying and all of a sudden somebody tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, that's cool. Yeah, that wasn't me. I'm trying to remember who that was, but boy, I'll tell you what, that would be something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be crazy. <laughs> well, I don't know. I could, probably, I could probably go to the baseball diamond over here by my house, but... You know, because there's hardly anybody in there that have to go off the hours, you know. Tonight would have been perfect fly just before the sun went down. We're dead, nothing. 
No yeah, a lot of nothing. times you can get on them ball diamonds and you can take off, take off on, you know, you know, from third to home or home to first. And, uh, yeah. Gives you a pretty good takeoff if they're not too dusty. dusty. Right. That's what I did when I was young. We used to go in a, in a uh, fairground and they had a ball diamond in there. And uh, I used to fly in there with my dad when I was young. And that worked pretty good. And then when my son was about, about I don't know, five or six years old, um, we had another ball diamond that. that it would they would water it down and keep the dust down, but the, the dirt would be hard enough to where it was a pretty good surface, and I would take off in there too. But now we pretty much what I do is we take a piece of carpet that's about four foot wide, and there's two pieces about twelve feet long. So we take that out, and put it on the grass, and, and you know tape them together. And, and that way it that gives way you a pretty nice, nice place to take off because off. sometimes the grass gets tall. You just can't yeah, get your yeah. blades out of the grass, you know. You're and after you break enough for those wood crops, you decide that, well, I decided that. Well, first what we did, we were taking half-inch plywood in there that we'd rip to about 30 inches and, and we'd take off oh on the plywood. And then I thought, you know, that's a pain in the butt, but, you know, you know, packing that all over the place. So <clears throat> then I come across this uh, carpet, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to take that carpet that was just remnant left over. And, um, it's it's real, it's, it's a low carpet, so you can run it uh, either side up, you know. And, uh, yeah. The grass is a little wet, we'll run it with the, the ground down. If it's, you know, if it's dry, you can run it either direction. And, um, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, that seems to be a pretty, pretty good takeoff runway. Yeah, it's nice to be able to practice your takeoffs if you, if you fly a stunt, that's something you care about is the takeoff, so yeah. you need to be able to do that. You know, and myself, I've been flying for years, and I've never ever, I've been to some contests, but like clear up in Seattle and around and there. Um, but I've never been to one around here. I've never ever flown in a contest. And and I know, yeah. you know, I do pretty good flying. It's, you know, I'm no expert in nothing, but I do pretty good pattern. And I do a lot of stuff that I like to do on my own. And But it's it's kind of like, my son says, it's kind of like, um, he water skis a lot. He's got a water ski tow boat, you know. And, he says you can ski and cut and all this and have a good time, but until you actually go through the ski course and you're cutting from ball to ball, you know, going through there, he says that's really an eye opener. So I, you know, I'm sure that'd be the same thing as far as stunt goes. You know, I can, I can. Well, I judge myself. I fly against myself. You know, we're our worst. Critics and critiquers, you know, when we're out there flying. But until you actually do that, you have somebody else um, taking points off your pattern. You know, it's like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'll bet that's really an eye opener. Yeah. Uh, and I just have an experience. When you're by yourself, you don't know when you're practicing mistakes and getting perfection on, you know, perfecting your muscle memory with mistakes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, when I first start, saw Stunt, I thought, oh, hell, I got this, you know, cause I could sling a half A plane like, around like there's no tomorrow, but doing it in a precision back way, that's a whole new, whole new thing. I love it. I've had a lot of fun with it, but some people prefer just to, compete with themselves and, and, and not have to worry about the contest atmosphere, but it's such a friendly contest type environment that I've really fallen in love with it. Yeah, I, I really like doing that, but my deal is, you know, to even get into something like that, I'd have to drive three, three and a half hours west of here to even be able to do that, and then, you know, you, you you practice, you practice a couple of times in the morning, and then you get a couple of flights, and that pretty much, that pretty much is your day. Where here, right. I can fly a dozen times in the morning, you know. Yeah. Um, 
which is pretty nice. So it depends on what a person's after. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I would definitely do it if, if we had that opportunity around here, but we just don't. We just don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, some guys do go out and with several airplanes they enter three different events and so they actually get more than just two flights in a day but not me it's, it's enough for me for me at the contest just to do my two rounds and watch everybody else and walk around and talk and have fun mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that, that'd be the thing to do is to two or three different events I wouldn't mind being able to be good enough just to fly to an event, even whether whether I get a trophy or not. I mean, I really don't care. Yeah, yeah just, just to be able to go to it. See what it's like. Participation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to learn the beginner pattern and go out there and see what you can do. And uh, mm -hmm. the yeah. thing is, a beginner and intermediate, and both, there's not and very many people enter, enter so many people you're liable enter. to come home with a trophy if you take off and crash. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, well. But, uh, but uh, you know, nobody's, know, nobody's ever, ever won a trophy, trophy that didn't, didn't fly. fly. Right. And yeah. one thing uh, uh, one of my, one of my buddies my told me before, before I ever before actually went to a went contest, to a contest is after it's after over, after, after that after first contest is over, is over, for the rest of your life, you can say, I flew competitive control line precision aerobatics, and nobody can ever take that away from you, you know? So, yep, yeah, that, that'd be cool. There you go. Nobody can ever take that away from you. And, of course, yep. you know, my mom uh, thinks I'm the most expert pilot there is. She thinks I invented all this stuff, you know? Hey, that's cool. Let her keep thinking that. <laughs> There's no asterisk in the book next to your... Next year, wins and losses. There you go. The camaraderie is the most incredible part, though. Yeah, it's, this sport is. Yeah, it's a good sport, that's for sure. I've had a lot of hobbies through the years, and this one's the one that comes back because something that I grew up with that I really enjoyed, you know, you know. Yep. That's why I still do it. Um, not only that, I, I love to build. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty satisfying when you can build an airplane and take it out and fly it and fly yeah. it's really yeah. good. You can and then it's really frustrating. Lots of people you, can't do, you know, it's yeah. hard to do. Yeah, and then it's frustrating when you Put a lot of time in one, and um, put it together, and then it won't fly at all. You know, it's like, oh, speaking of that, I um, years ago, years ago, I built this Carl Goldberg P40. It was a, a design that was a lot like their shoestring, and anyhow, anyhow, I put a uh, stunt hanger 35 control line engine on it engine on it i put it all together and i i airbrushed this paint job on there it looked really nice it was one of my really better models of the time i took it over to my brother-in-law's house and i said hey check this out let's run this run this on the ground we'll bench run this one time before i take it over and fly it well anyway we we went to start it and i primed it and, and the thing went poof and fire came out of the exhaust, you know, uh, where that fuel was, and it got on my airplane, and that airplane completely burned up in about 30 seconds. Oh, my God. Yeah, That's it was gone. And, and so, you know, I don't know what it is. I've never had that happen with any other engine other than that, and, and so that Super Tiger engine, and... I have a nemesis with Super Tigers ever since, and, and you know they make some great engines. But for some reason, it's a metal block that I stay away from them because my airplane that I just built and was brand new, brand new, 
burnt to the ground. I mean, it's amazing how fast that paint and that balsa burns up. It, it burns in a hurry. I almost burned one up. I managed to snuff it in time, but I didn't have my uh, heat gun to shrink the uh, tube around where I had just um, put uh, heat shrink on at the bell crank. And so I decided to use a... Uh, what was I using? A little uh, mini torch, a little butane mini torch. Oh, butane and torch. I started a rag on fire, and I, I had to throw a rag on it to put it out. You're but lucky I you didn't burn it, it all up because they go fast. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah another second, it would have been gone, go just like yours. Yeah. Gone. Just like yours. yeah, my brother in law says, fire extinguisher, because he had one in his house. No need. I mean, it was, it was, in 30 seconds, that thing was ashes. It was that fast. If I ever have a plane catch on fire, I hope it's in the middle of a flight. There you go. That, yeah, yeah. That would be spectacular. <laughs> Run it till it's dust. Yeah. My left the engine to come off that thing and go fly and hit somebody in the head. Oh, God. I had a, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, uh, um, my youngest son was flying, and he's going around. We started hearing this vibration, and me and my older son, we looked at each other, and I'm going to lose a, a muffler. And sure enough, we come around, another couple of laps, and that muffler came off. We didn't even see it. This stuff goes so fast, we didn't even see it. And it came off, and it hit me in the neck, and, it, and, it, and just enough to skim me, and then it bounced off my son. And and just hit me like that was enough that it burned my neck, my skin. And, and I'm kidding you, it was so fast, we didn't even see it coming. That's how fast that stuff goes. Did he burn? Did he get burned, too? No, my son didn't get burned because it, it just it grazed me and grazed him, but it was on his shirt, but it was on my skin. Uh, and, I can't believe it. Yeah, it was, it was just enough. I said, man, just think that a nail us in the head, that would hurt like hell. But, yeah, it came across there. I don't know how fast it was going, but it was whipping. And, uh, no, we didn't see it coming. We didn't see it coming. That, that's <coughs> funny, now. Yeah, yeah, just to change yeah. the RPM of the engine, it gets loud and all of a sudden, thud. Yeah, I've had a muffler come off before, fly off into the woods, and I never found it again. Yeah, I had one do that even in a grass field. We were not even in the grass. We couldn't find the dang thing. But it wasn't the whole muffler. It was the cone off the end of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, them Fox engines, they, they put them together with a little rope, rope pin. And these little dinky rope pins are only like a sixteenth of an inch. They got two or three of them in there. And... And it came out, and that little cone come off the end of that thing. Never did find it. It's like you got to be kidding all that. And we, I mean, we had a pretty general idea where it was, but it must have went way out and never, never land because we never did come across it. I had the Venturi come off of the TDO four and out on my baby flight streak one day, and unbelievably, I walked the circle and found that Venturi after just a couple of passes. Wow. Cause that's a tiny <laughs> little venturi. Yeah, they oh. are little, little. Well, guys, I gotta get to work tomorrow morning, so I'm gonna go to bed. Okay, Chris. Uh, okay, well, Chris, thanks for coming in, coming in and answering yeah. my questions, and and uh, I'll go back out tomorrow and play with my new taps and tap handle and see if I can do anything productive. There you go. Yeah, it's good oh. to have a machinist in in the. In the Far more we can absolutely get some, get some heads up on some questions and stuff. Um, that's one of my deals is I want to get set up with a little mill and a little lathe. My son has a business and he has a little lathe, but it's got to be worked over. And uh, my son, when we get to where we're doing that, you might be a good hand for me to leave me in some directions on some parts. Not a problem. Cool. Cool. All right, All right man. We'll talk to you guys later. Hey, we'll see you. See you Friday, maybe. Yep. All right, bye. Yeah, Friday, I'll we'll get hooked up. Hopefully, we get a few more people on here, and, and uh, I'll get my cords out and get them hooked up so I can drag my camera uh, in my other room and 
and I'll bring up some of my stuff from my basement. Yeah, that'll be pretty cool. Show them off. Yeah, I've got a lot of toys. I'll, I'll try uh, to think of toys. something good for show and tell too. Um, I wish I could do this from my shop, but it's just not convenient for me out there. Well, yeah, I've got my shop downstairs, and eventually I might be able to. See, I've got cords from my computer that go down into my basement and they're routed out across the ceiling in the basement and then they come up through another wall so I can run my HDMI and um, sound system stuff from my computer over to my TV. Yeah. And I think what I'm going to do is, is just drop some cords down in the basement where I can hook up down there to where the only problem is doing that I won't be able to see I can hear and everything but I won't be able to see the screen like I yeah. can now but you know a, a thing like that you guys could lead me around with the camera right. you know and you go up or down or closer or whatever and, and that way you could see more of my stuff because my whole basement well I've got about seven eight hundred square feet of basement down there and the whole thing's an airplane Oh, wow. Um, and I've got a shop out in the back of my yard as part of my driveway, and I've got airplanes hanging out there. And then I've got a bedroom up in this level where I live that it's it's an airplane hanger. So I've got, uh -huh. you know, and not only that, I, I build, I build um, control line planes, and then I build... Um, you know, like the rubber powered stuff once in a while. And and I build a lot of plastics. In fact, for the years that I didn't do control line modeling, I built plastics and I've got plastics all over the country. In fact, I've even got one of my models in the Cassini Museum over there in Florida. Uh, so I've got plastics scattered all over the place. When I was a kid, I used to build a lot of the plastic battleships and Mm -hmm. tanks and things like that as well as airplanes too a really nice poker dr1 that my uh, high school history teacher lost oh man yeah i wouldn't mind building a dr1 or a d7 something like that even in a stunt ship but it's a matter of completely doing that from scratch and, and uh, you know and i've done that but boy i'll tell you what um you're talking a whole winter you know you're talking a lot you're talking six month build by the time you get started and get into yeah. on something like that now you know i have the time to build now which i didn't have before which is one of the problems that kept me from staying in this sport i guess because i had too many hobbies my problem was is i had so many hobbies i was just strung out you know and, and then trying to work overtime every chance i had so i could go spend my money you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my flying buddy's got a lot of hobbies too. He's he's a member of a fishing club, and he uh, uh, is a competitive marksman, and he also works with the old uh, Civil War era stuff competitively. That at that also he shoots shoots traps competitively and does all kind of stuff. He's he's older than me, but he's he's got a lot more get up and go than I do. And he's you know, good at all of it. Well, that's cool. You know, it, and that stuff like that, you're, you're busy doing something all the time. Yeah. You know? There's always something going on. But I'm sure getting to where I like this control line stuff again. And it's, it's stuff that I can do and feel pretty good about it. I'm, I'm not it's the great, really greatest good. builder in the world either, but I can do a fair job and I can... Um, I can go out there and, and fly what I want to fly and have a great time. And, and uh, you know, like I say, we, we critique ourselves and we're our worst critics. And Absolutely. Sometimes when you put it together and it just feels right, you know, it's like, wow, that was fun. Mm -hmm. That was a good time. And it's relatively inexpensive as hobbies go, too. Once you it get, is. Once you get tooled up and got everything you need to build, then... You know, it's it's pretty inexpensive. A it lot is. less goes into it than remote control stuff. Oh boy, you're not kidding. Turbos and electronics. 
Yeah, those guys and the radio controls suck thousands in that. Uh, you know, and now they're doing the the radial engines and they're doing the gas turbine engines and yeah. You know, the sky's the limit with that stuff. It's how much money you you have to to uh, you know, uh, and and now it's the point where you get a lot of people that you'll get some. But either it'll spend two or three years building an airplane. They don't even fly it. You fly it for them, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it just they're just builders, you know. And, and and me, I when it comes to control line stuff, my dad he would get so dizzy so fast, you know. He'd only go out there and put three or four laps in a circle, and he'd be yelling at me, "Come in, come in, come in!" And uh, I'd go and take the handle for me. He couldn't get over it, huh? He he just never did, and. Uh, so I didn't up flying most of the time, and, and I didn't have a problem with that because I like being on the end of the handle, you know. But some people, it just my dad was an excellent, excellent builder, just really good builder, and, and really, um, I don't know what you were. He, he was perfection. He he was a perfectionist, and and he was that way at his job too, and it. Um, you know, he was a diesel mechanic and rebuilt differentials and transmissions. And yeah. um, he was known in the shop for being one of the best, you know, and that's pretty cool stuff. And it's because your attention to detail, you know. Mm-hmm. And I kind of learned from that, too. I'm pretty much a detail freak. So, but I'm not as hard on the detail anymore. I get to where I put so much time in. A particular area and I could put like another five hours in it and I think well I think I'm just gonna go to get it done so you put another two and you short yourself the three that could have really been a masterpiece yeah. you know it's still pretty good but it's not what it could have been and you're satisfied with that and you get it done that's that's yeah. the kind of work I get to where I'm doing anymore is I get to where I want to keep moving on because and I, I get to so a point models. where I realize that the uh, 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 some of these little details uh, don't affect how it flies. Just the, you know, the finish, the fit and finish of it. And, and then, so I guess uh, I, I like to make them really pretty. So yeah, I kind of compromise the best I can on that. So. Oh, I'm going to take a break here for just a minute. I'm going to cut out for a couple of minutes. Okay. I'll be here when you get back. Maybe somebody else will come in and visit me. I think I'll drop over to YouTube and see who's on over there. It doesn't look like anybody, everybody that was trying to get in. Now, Terry, Terry Forbes, can I get in via Apple smartphone? If not, I'll move a laptop. Terry, I don't know. And don't know if you're still watching. Let me see if there's any way to find out. I can't tell. And Jumby, I think I'm thinking Jumby might not be watching anymore. Can't tell unless you type something. But uh, I apologize to you guys that I forgot to press the enter button after I put the link into it because I did that first thing. One of these days, I'll get it smoothed out. Got seven viewers. I think uh, when uh, Wiley gets back, I'm probably good for a few more minutes, and that's about it. So. Okay. All right. Are you with us, Wiley? I'm. I'm with you. I'm going to cut out in and out here for just a minute because I'm going to put a couple of chords together and I'm going to give you kind of a teaser of what I can start out showing um, Friday night. Okay. And uh, if I can get my chords all together here. That'll be a good closing cliffhanger for us. You can give her a yeah. preview of the next episode. Yeah, there we go. Wednesdays must just be a slow night because this is the second Wednesday in a row that uh, it's been 
relatively quiet here. Yeah, Wednesdays are, you know, in the middle of the week and people are still busy, got a lot of things going on, and especially these guys that have their families, you know. I'll tell you what, that was a treat the other night, though, having, uh, um, what was his name, uh, Gerald from from uh, New Zealand? Wasn't yeah. that sweet? Yeah, that was pretty cool. That was really neat. We got to meet his kids, too. They seemed pretty enthusiastic, especially the... I think it was the younger one was yeah, uh, the younger. most talkative, and he was he was excited about it. <laughs> yeah, it was something else. That's what we like, get that young stuff. Oh, you got to be kidding me. They got me a cord here, and they didn't put an end on one end. Wow. Well, let me see what else I can come up with. I can run my camera and uh, what are they doing here? I've got some cords laying around that I can muster up. And I'm I'm hoping I can get to where I can go fifty feet. I'm not sure I can make that. We'll see. You talking about Ethernet cable? Um no, it's it's uh um, this cable is just regular, the, what is it, the 3.5 millimeter jack stuff for my headphones. Uh, my camera just runs on a regular, um, uh, what do you call it, HDMI. No, it's not HDMI, this is U UBS or whatever they call it. USB, there we go. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll just have to see if I lose my camera here hooking this up. I'm not sure that this will... This will cut us out or if I'll be all right. Um, well, that kind of bums me out. I need both them cables to run my speaker and my headphones. Okay, I'll see if this works. Okay, your camera went out on us. I'm just looking at my uh, hangout toolbox here, and or the camera toolbox, and I'm wondering what 3D broadcast is. Can you still hear me, Wally? I've got no uh, video or audio from Wally right now, but he's rearranging his cable so he can take us on a um, mini tour of his airplanes.
I see we still got eight viewers for those of you that are watching right now. We're waiting for Wally to hook up his uh, uh, system down in the other part of his house where all of his airplanes are hanging and give us a tour of his hangar. And then when we get uh, finished looking at that, we're probably going to sign out tonight because uh, as it turns out, Wednesday nights seem to be a slow night. And um, we've had great turnouts on Mondays and Fridays. But we might we might kick out of here in the next few minutes. But for everybody that's hung in there with us, I appreciate it. Oh, there's my buddy behind me on the red chair, the professor, my one-eyed shop assistant. <laughs> and I'm not getting much feedback from Wiley. Well, give him a couple of more minutes and see and if he doesn't uh have any success hooking up then we're gonna get on out of here and come back friday 9 30 eastern time more or less And I think we're going to hang it up. Wiley, if you can hear me, um, hope you can come back Friday night and uh, give us a tour of your airplanes. I'll try to bring some more things for show and tell like I did at first tonight. And um, don't want to sit here with dead air. And uh, all you guys watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. I apologize for being late posting that link. But uh, I'll get those kind of bugs worked out as we go along. And so until Friday, don't forget to uh, like us over on YouTube and subscribe to the Stunt Hanger channel on YouTube. Subscribe to Stunt Hanger if you're not already. So in the meantime, uh, as Sparky would say, fair winds, tight lines, and we'll see you on Friday.